my name is uh, Paul Bartz, and on behalf of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture. For many of you, um, Scott Alexander uh, needs no introduction. Uh, he's spoken on campus many times. Uh, he's been a friend, uh, advocate, and consultant for our department. Um, he's spoken in the local community. He's a very familiar uh, figure um, on Christian-Muslim dialogue in the Cleveland area, uh, particularly um, campus. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, Dr. Alexander, um, I could rehearse his many awards, fellowships, degrees, publications, uh, board memberships, journal editorships, uh, all of the marks of um, extraordinary uh, academic distinction. Um, but rather than to catalog uh, that uh, very long list of accomplishments, I thought I would just say um, that his work on bringing the scholarship, his enormous uh, scholarship on the tradition of Islam to bear on Muslim-Christian uh, dialogue uh, has been uh, rather extraordinary. Um, and particularly, given the focus of that dialogue to uh, increase uh, mutual understanding of Christians and Muslims. Um, so there is an enormous scholarly uh, apparatus to Dr. Alexander's uh, work, uh, but it's targeted in a way that's quite distinctive for uh, an academic. And we were talking uh, over dinner about how so many scholars uh, speak only to those uh, kind of within the guild. Uh, and that is not true of uh, Scott Alexander. Uh, he uh, is a scholar of the first order, uh, but he also uh, speaks to non-scholars uh, in a very uh, powerful way, uh, all toward the goal of uh, promoting mutual cooperation, mutual understanding. In fact, I can hardly think of anyone who's been more important to promoting a Catholic a Muslim dialogue uh, in the U.S. than uh, Scott uh, Alexander. Um, so with that sense of his um, vocation, his mission, uh, please join me in welcoming our lecturer this evening, Scott Alexander. Well, the uh, appropriate traditional Muslim response to Paul's uh, humbling introduction is simply to say, Astaghfirullah, which means I seek God's forgiveness. And uh, truly I do. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I wanted to begin uh, this evening uh, by just wishing all the Muslims who are here among us uh, Eid Mubarak. Um, this evening at sunset uh, marks the, the, the coming of the second of the two great festivals of the Muslim calendar. Some of you know one is the Eid al-Fitr, which ends the, the holy month of Ramadan, the month of fasting. And the other is the Eid al-Adha, or the feast of the sacrifice of Abraham. And uh, that is occurring right now. Uh, throughout the Muslim world, um, with some variations for time zones, uh, but uh, the Eid has sort of just begun now in North America. I was reading my email uh, this morning and got a lot of uh, Eid greetings, just being on the listserv of a lot of various Muslim organizations. And I was really impressed by the Eid greetings from an organization that really is near and dear to my heart. It's uh, called Iman. Uh, I-M-A-N, uh, it's the Arabic word for faith, but it happens to be an acronym in this case for Inner City Muslim Action Network. Uh, it's a Muslim organization that does amazing social service work in some uh, poorer communities on the south side of Chicago. And I wanted to read to you, sort of as a prayer, the best wishes that were sent from Iman. 
As the eclectic and far-reaching strands of the human family come together today for one of the most impressive and enduring spiritual gatherings on the planet, the references to the Hajj and the, this sacrifice is the, the climax of the Hajj, we are reminded of the profound power of aligning hearts and souls in remembrance of something greater than ourselves. We are inspired by those pilgrims on this trip of a lifetime as they ascend Jabal Arafat, Jabal Rahmah, the Mount of Mercy. Today, pilgrims from every corner of the globe stood together robed in white, beseeching the mercy of the Most High. And we as one human family should be reminded at this time of all the tremendous things we can accomplish by God's grace, together, even in the face of some of society's greatest challenges. Like the pilgrims who have stood in simple solidarity on the plains of Arafat, we too must stand together seeking mercy and seeking to become a force for mercy, goodness, inspiration, and transformation in the community. May you all be touched by mercy today, and may you all enjoy a blessed time with family and friends around the celebration of Eid al-Adha this week. Amen. Amen. Um, I expressed my formal thanks at the outset of the lecture series last night, but I want to again uh, honor the memory of Walter and Mary Tui, whose generosity have made possible each year uh, people coming to campus to talk about things interreligious, um, come to a campus, uh, to a great university uh, that is so uh, committed uh, to a Catholic tradition of engagement and dialogue uh, with the entire human family and, and certainly uh, across the all too often dividing lines of our faith differences. I want to thank um, especially Professor John Spencer, uh, who is the interim director of the, of the TUI program, and Professor Paul Lordson, who's uh, gone way beyond uh, uh, his uh, call of duty by being one of my shepherds today, uh, and the irrepressible uh, Kathy uh, Merhar from the Theology and Religious Studies Department, who's always working furtively behind the scenes to make sure everything runs so smoothly. I want to also thank Dr. Zeki Saritoprak, um, my dear colleague and friend uh, in the department of the, the, the occupier of the Norsi Chair in Islamic Studies in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. I know without whose uh, uh, kind estimation and advocacy I probably wouldn't be standing before you. And finally, really want to thank each and every one of you on a gorgeous night like this for, for coming here and, and being willing to um, uh, receive what, what little I have to share. Okay. Let's see. Hmm. The remote's not working. I'm going to re-plug in my little plug-in and see what's going on. Spell not working. Why is that? There we go. It's working now. Okay. So, the title of, of uh, this evening's presentation is Islam and Muslims in the domestic and international context. Moving beyond media soundbites, I'd say that this is one of those cases, maybe often it's the case where the subtitle is more important than the title. Um, you know, the title gives us a sense of, of, of what the focus is, um, but the, the direction and, and dynamic that I'm going to try to move into in this presentation is the idea of moving beyond media soundbites when it comes to understanding Islam and Muslims in the domestic and international context. You know, I, I always imagine, it might be wrong, Professor Natopsky is here, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, sometimes I envy people who are going to go into a room full uh, of US Americans who are non-Buddhists to talk about Buddhism. They probably have various cultural assumptions about Buddhists, but they're probably largely benign. Um, and uh, there's, th th there aren't many negative stereotypes, I guess is what I'm trying to say, swirling about in their heads. It's not the case 
uh, for people who walk into a room to hear any kind of presentation on Islam. Certainly not the case in post-Iranian Revolution U.S. or, or now more recently post-9-11 U.S. There's been lots of intense media focus uh, on Muslims and Islam. I, I use quotation marks because the media focus really isn't on Muslims and Islam. It's on a very interesting and oftentimes distorted dimensions of who Muslims are and what Islam is. And the primary reason for that is not because people in the media, uh, by and large, uh, some do, but by and large have an out for Muslims or have some deep-seated prejudice against Islam. Some do. But it's usually because our interest as a society in Islam and Muslims, particularly overseas, is almost always connected to times when, for one reason or another, there's a conflict between a certain group of Muslims and U.S. political or foreign policy interests. You know, trying to understand a faith tradition that is over 14 centuries old, that has existed in hundreds of different cultures, that has been the, the, the force enlivening and giving meaning to the lives of, 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 of millions and millions of people for all those centuries, through the lens of one particular conflict that's happening at one particular time um, is really a fool's quest. To come right down to it and give you a metaphor or analogy that I often use uh, that I hope drives home the point, you know, trying to understand Islam and Muslims in the fullness of their reality um, through the lens of an event like September 11th, or even some of the political conflicts that are going on in the world today, is something akin to trying to understand the rich tradition of Roman Catholicism through the lens of the priestly abuse scandal. It's not that priestly sexual abuse is not part of Roman Catholic history. It is. It's a very sad, lamentable, and regrettable part of the history of Roman Catholicism here in the United States and in other parts of the world. Those of us who are Roman Catholic have to own that part of our history. But I don't know many Roman Catholics who cherish their faith, who would want non-Catholics to kind of begin their exploration of Catholicism and loop back around to end it, working all within the framework of the sex abuse scandal. Let me interpret everything about Catholicism through the lens of the sex abuse scandal. If we try to interpret everything about Islam and Muslims through the lens of some of the conflicts that are going on, or that have gone in the late 20th century, early 20th century, we really are not um, uh, seeing the whole picture. So this is part of the problem. Um, the media sound bite is not very long. It's a sound bite, so it doesn't allow uh, for any depth of inquiry and depth of analysis. And also it tends to be focused on very you know, conflictual contexts. And oftentimes, uh, therefore, because it's focused on conflict, focus on extremes. And so what I'd like to do here this evening is try to just spend a, 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 a better part of an hour with you uh, on about eight issues. I'll spend a little more time on some than on others, uh, attempting to move beyond those sound bites. And I'm hoping you realize that it doesn't take that much to move beyond those sound bites. And, and my hope is that if we move a little bit beyond those sound bites, you'll be better equipped to critically assess those sound bites in the future. And also to, uh, to explore uh, more in-depth information that you can find from more reliable sources as you, as you try to think things through. Uh, when it comes to the topic of Islam and Muslims in the domestic and international <coughs> context. Uh, this, by the way, is the, anyone recognize this? This is Islamic Center of Greater Cleveland in Parma. That's the domestic, right? And anyone recognize this structure? Turks may not answer. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Sultan, Ah Sultan Ahmed Jami, the, the great uh, uh, mosque of Sultan Ahmed in Istanbul, sometimes known as the Blue Mosque. Um, if you all get a chance, you've got to go to Istanbul. It's one of the most amazing cities in the world, and it's really a showcase uh, for one of the great, um, one of the great uh, Muslim civilizations, the Ottoman civilization. So 
So let's move forward. Um, I wanted to start, start, whoa, that was a little bit of my Boston accent sort of coming back. <laughs> start, 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 start. I wanted to start by talking a little bit uh, about um, the history of Christian-Muslim relations from a Catholic perspective. We're at a Catholic institution. Um, you know, it, it continues to be characterized uh, by two narratives. One is a narrative of uh, dialogue, um, and the other is a narrative of a confrontation. One is a narrative of cooperation, and the other is a narrative of conflict. It's kind of been that way from the beginning, and it continues to be that way. Um, it's not as if uh, at some point in history there was a turn from conflict to dialogue or from dialogue to conflict. Um, Muslims and Christians have been existing uh, in conflict with one, with one another and in deep convivencia uh, with one another, to use the Spanish term, deep life together uh, ever since the beginning of Christian-Muslim encounters. Which should be a key to us in, in, in terms of developing the insight that there's nothing essential about either Christianity or Islam, about either Muslims or Christians, that puts them in conflict with each other. That when Muslims are in conflict with each other, or when they are not, it oftentimes has to do with the nature of the context in which they're living. And we'll have some occasions to talk a little bit about this as we move through some of the slides. In the Second Vatican Council, there was no denial of the fact that the history of Christian-Muslim relations has been one of conflict and cooperation, right? Um, but there was a clarion call uh, to Christians letting them know which of those two narratives they were to invest in, or I should say, in which of those two narratives they were to invest. And that is that by virtue of their baptismal call, to be peaceful, and in virtue of the teaching that the church is to be the universal sacrament of salvation and healing for the human family, Christians need to invest themselves in the narrative of dialogue and cooperation and do everything they can uh, to reduce those instances of, of, of conflict and confrontation. The Vatican II document Nostra Aetate clearly states the church's uncompromising commitment to dialogue and cooperation with people of other religions, especially in section three, Muslims. This is a wonderful image. Um, it's an image of the visit of Abdullah Turki of the Muslim World League to the Vatican in May of 1999. And he's giving uh, a gift of the Quran to Pope John Paul II. Um, and you notice what Pope John Paul II is doing. He's kissing the Quran. If you Google Pope Kiss Quran, you'll probably get this image. And if you go to the website, some, many of the websites on which you find this image are websites that use this image to claim that this is proof positive that John Paul II was the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, and it's true. Why? Because they'll say, well, you know, if you read the Quran, you'll see there, there are things in the Qur'an that directly contradict the Christian faith. The Qur'an says, appears to say, Jesus was not crucified. The Qur'an strongly emphasizes that Jesus was just a human being and was not divine. So if the Pope is kissing the Qur'an, then he must be secretly accepting these Muslim doctrines and trying to undo the Catholic Church as an agent of Islam from within. They're missing the point, right? Uh, his gesture is a gesture of respect and love for the faith of his visitor. And this is something that I believe is deeply consonant with the Christian faith. I also believe it's deeply consonant with, with Muslim faith. Um, and it has to do with the best of who we are as Christians and Muslims. Um, this is an image of uh, Pope Benedict XVI. Um, who's standing uh, next to, at the time, his newfound friend uh, in 2006, the chief mufti of Istanbul, Mustafa Chalja, 
And they're standing in the Blue Mosque, in Sultan Ahmad, facing the Mihrab, and, and they're each engaging in prayer in their own tradition, although the Pope is actually adopting the stance uh, of the Iqama, the standing position that Sunni Muslims take uh, when they're about to perform the Salat. Pope Benedict said, I repeat with insistence, research and interreligious and intercultural dialogue are not an option, but a vital necessity for our time. That should read, sorry I was typing too fast. Um, our time. Um, I, I wanted to just save some space. Um, there's a great image of Pope Francis. Uh, some of you may have seen this in the news. Um, this last Holy Thursday, washing the feet of inmates at a juvenile detention center in Rome. Four of those feet were the feet of Muslim women. And Pope Francis has also said that the dialogue with Islam is critically important because what Muslims and Christians have to do together is emphasize to the world that you can't love God without loving your fellow human beings and you can't love your fellow human beings without loving God. The second point that I just want to raise as we go through my eight points here, and these, this isn't exactly moving beyond media sound bites, but rather sort of setting the stage for the subsequent six points, is that we have a problem with what's called Islamophobia in the United States. Islamophobia is kind of the equivalent, whether you like the term or not, it, you know, the, there's never an apt term to uh, sort of describe or to encapsulate all the dimensions of of a reality like, you know, something like anti-Semitism. But it's kind of the, 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 the hatred and bigotry, especially in a systemic and communal way directed towards Muslims, the way anti-Semitism is this, this virulent force of hatred and bigotry and prejudice directed against Jews. Anti-Muslim hate crimes soared by 50% in 2010, skyrocketing over 2009 levels. Um, in a year marked by the incendiary rhetoric of Islam bashing politicians and activists, especially over the so-called Ground Zero Mosque in New York City, which as you know was neither a mosque nor actually at Ground Zero. It was the highest level of anti-Muslim hate crime since 2001, the year of the September 11th attacks, when the FBI reported 481 anti-Muslim hate crimes. The year 2010 saw multiple verbal attacks on planned mosques, along with several violent attacks and arsons and the first attempt to ban Sharia religious law, even though the Constitution already precludes such a ban. This is a quote from the Spring 2012 Bulletin of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Some of you may know the SPLC. They're a very important agency that monitors hate groups and hate crimes um, that have their origin in the civil rights struggle. And um, they're very good at uh, monitoring, um, you know, uh, uh, anti-black, white supremacist movements, you know, as well as anti-Semitic movements and groups, and, and they're of late been moving into monitoring um, anti-Muslim anti or Islamophobic uh, groups. Uh, things have gotten a little better than 2010, but uh, if you're in my business, you know that there are still very disturbing signs uh, and, and data that this is still on the upswing. So this is the context in which we're living right now. Um, and in which I'm working, and why a significant part of my ministry um, is dedicated to fighting Islamophobia. Uh, I'm not so much trying to defend Muslims as I am trying to defend the human family. Because I think, you know, any form of bigotry and hatred, especially when it becomes systemic and oppressive, not only direct, directly injures the targeted community and targeted group, but it actually offends against all our dignity. It drags us all down, and it's, it's a real corrosive force uh, working against the solidarity of the human family that we all need to be working for. My third point is, it, it, it kind of comes from an axiom in my discipline. I'm, I'm not really formally trained as a theologian, I'm formally trained as a historian of religions, as, as, as many of the faculty in the Theology and Religious Studies Department are. And, um, you know, in, in the uh, discipline of religious studies, uh, one of the things, you know, you quickly learn is that one of the most misleading features of the way in which we talk about religions 
especially these so-called great religious traditions of the world, like Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, etc., is that we use nouns in the singular to refer to them. Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. Why is that so misleading? Why is that so problematic? Because the singularness of the noun masks the stunning diversity that it's actually referencing. Think of Christianity. Well, actually, think of Judaism. It's, it's better. I'm not saying Judaism is better than Christianity. Think, but it's a better example. It's a better example. Maybe better in some ways, but it's a better example. Um, there are about 15, one five million Jews in the world. Rather small, demographically, the Jewish tradition is rather small, right? 15 million Jews. And at least five major, just at, according to one typology, five major expressions of Jewish identity, right? You have, you know, neo orthodoxy, you know, orthodoxy includes modern orthodoxy. You've got um, conservative Judaism, you've got a conservative movement, a reform movement, a reconstructionist movement. And you have all kinds of Jews that I, that, that, for whom Jewish peoplehood and Jewish identity is extremely important, but who don't necessarily practice Judaism qua religion. So there's a whole you know, set of secular manifestations of Jewish identity. Most of the Jews, well, this dynamic is kind of changing because of different population shifts in Israel. But, but I think today, probably statistically, the majority of Jews in Israel are still secular Jews who don't you know, necessarily practice any particular form of Judaism, be it orthodox or, or conservative or reform or reconstruction. Um, so that's 15 million. Now move to 2 billion Christians. Just open the phone book in Indianapolis and witness Christian diversity. If you look up Christian churches, how many denominations there are. You can do it in Cleveland too, I'm sure. Are there still phone books? I don't know, you can tell my age. I'm referencing things like phone books, right? So excuse me. But, but you, know, you know where I'm going. Islam is no different. Islam is not a monolith. It's a faith lived out in a variety of different cultural and historical expressions, some of which certain Muslims deem to be more authentic than others. There are kind of two points here, right? Islam is not one thing, right? Islam is interpreted and lived out in a variety of different ways. In this way, it's not like any other uh, of the world's you know, prominent uh, and populous religious traditions. Some of these forms are deemed to be more authentic than others by Muslims who are living out the various forms of uh, and interpretations of their faith that they're living out. This is a reference to the sectarian dynamic. This is why some Christians look at other Christians and say, you're not really a Christian, even though they're, you know, so, so you know, uh, Mormons, you know, identify themselves as the church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Latter Saints. They very much see themselves as Christians, but official, official Catholic teaching says Mormons are Christians because they don't use the Trinitarian formula in baptism. Okay, whatever. <laughs> That's just an example of kind of that sectarian dynamic. Some evangelicals will look at Catholics and mainline Protestants and say, you know, infant baptism, as it's practiced in these traditions, is invalid. So all these people who think they've been baptized in the body of Christ haven't really been. And they're not really Christian unless they've had some personal, deeply affective encounter with Christ, which moves them to accept Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So you know how this goes. And in Islam, there's a similar dynamic. You know, people interpret Islam in different ways. For the most part, you know, there's a lot of mutual acceptance of these differences, but then at certain points, you know, there are differences which, which, which some judge to be intolerable. All right, moving on to the fourth point, I just want to try a little experiment. So hopefully you can see we're already getting beyond media sound bites because, you know, the, the media uses terms like Islam in a very monolithic way, right? And even Muslims, you think Muslims all do the same thing, think the same way, you know? Uh, well, they don't, any more than Christians do the same thing, think the same way. <coughs> so that is the theoretical point I'm making about the use of these singular terms to describe traditions. Let's, let's, let's look at this from the human angle now. Anyone know who this lady is? Malala. Who? Malala. 
Okay, good guess. It was Malala Yusuf Zai. It's not Malala Yusuf Zai, but it could be. I could have put Malala's picture up here, but then actually I wouldn't be as sneaky as I'm trying to be because someone knew Malala Yusuf Zai. See, I'm, I'm trying to put a picture up here that, that on one level you all should know who she is, but you don't know who she is. See, this is my, this is my, this is my um, strategy. Anybody know who she is? Okay. Yes. Is it um, Dahlia Mugahan? It's not Dahlia Mugahan, but that's a good that's a good guess. Her name is Tawakkul Karman, and she won the Nobel Peace Prize last year. Not most recently, went to the chemical weapons folks. Last year, she won the Nobel Peace Prize for her work as an animating force, leading force in the Jasmine Democratic Revolution in her native Yemen. Okay. So she's a pious, practicing Muslim, right? Mahajuba, she wears the hijab, right? Winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Nobody knows her. And there are Muslims in this audience, right? They don't know her. When I, when, if I show this image to an audience in Chicago of all Muslims, it's the same thing. Why do not even the Muslims in this room or the non-Muslims in this room recognize her? It's because we're all watching the same media. If I show this in Yemen, lots of people will recognize, everyone will recognize the she right? So we've got to be aware of our own context and, and the information we get and, and how that affects our powers of recognition for people we identify as icons of the tradition. Now I'm going to ask a flip version of the question I asked about Tawakal Karman about this guy. Is there anybody that doesn't know who this guy is? <laughs> Get my point? You're laughing, but it's, 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 it's on one level, it's not too funny. And I bet you the Muslims aren't laughing all that much. And why do I say that? Because, you know, everyone recognizes the global, the, the global terrorist who claims to be Muslim. But no one recognizes the image of the Nobel Peace Prize winner who claims to be Muslim. So, We've got a perception problem, folks, right? At the very least. Let's go on with this. Anyone know who this dude is? He's the one from Bangladesh. Say what? He's the one who has the banks. The yes, States. Grameen Bank. Muhammad Yunus. Another Nobel Peace Prize winner in the 2000s. These aren't, by the way, you'll see a few Muslim Nobel Peace Prize winners here, and they're all from the 2000s, so it's not really distant memory. How about this guy? Yeah, Fort Hood, where I was born, actually. Um, this is uh, Major Nidal Hassan, uh, who now awaits uh, execution uh, for his crime of killing his fellow soldiers at Fort Hood. Just a note about the relationship or lack thereof between these two, and sometimes the media sound bites don't give us enough information to make distinctions. I don't know if you know anything about the story of Major Nadal Hassan. He's a very disturbed individual. I'm not suggesting that Osama bin Laden was not disturbed in his own way. But uh, it seems fair to, to, to say that bin Laden was probably a very sound mind. Um, Nadal, he was a, uh, Major Hassan was a psychiatrist in the army. And not that this justifies what he did, not one iota. But he really was persecuted in this all-male environment, which is very hierarchical. He was harassed constantly for being Palestinian and for being Muslim. Again, it doesn't justify what he did. But actually, I would submit to you that the profile of Major uh, Nidal Hassan conforms much more closely to Columbine and the perpetrators of the Columbine crime. Young men who feel ostracized from the mainstream, you know, cool, you know, male groups that they're trying to be a part of, and eventually lash out violently um, by getting guns and killing those whom they feel to be uh, the agents of their ostracization. You know, so it's it's easy to conflate the stories of someone like uh, Major Nidal Hassan with that of Osama bin Laden, but. But really, they're very different animals in so many different ways. That's important to recognize in terms of moving beyond media sound bites. How about this lady? 
This is Shireen Abadi, another Nobel Peace Prize winner. She's an Iranian lawyer who uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize for her work on behalf of women and children's rights in her native Iran. How about these folks? This is Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey and Amine Erdogan, his wife. Now, once upon a time, this is probably you know, going to change uh, um, if it already hasn't because of some recent reforms that were passed in Turkish law. <laughs> Once upon a time, this would have been a rare photo op, especially in Turkey, to see the two of them together. Anyone know why? Because she's wearing a headscarf. Yes, because she's wearing a headscarf. Why would that mean, what would be the problem with the two of them appearing in public together with her wearing a headscarf? Turkey's like a 95% plus Muslim majority country. Huh? It's <coughs> Yes, right. Until recently, there's been some recent reform. Until recently, the wearing of the headscarf in public places or state events was against the law in Turkey. Now, when you're married to the prime minister of Turkey, almost everywhere you go is de facto a state event. So you can imagine that this can be problematic. Right? Now, Turkey is a country that is adjacent, shares a border with Iran. In Turkey for the longest time, a woman could not wear a headscarf expressing her traditional Muslim piety and enroll in university or sit in the House of Parliament with her Congress with her headscarf on. In Iran, another 95 plus percent majority Muslim country, a woman can't go out of the house without her headscarf on let alone enter university, which is a Muslim country. Well, the Iranians will say, we're the Muslim country. You know? uh, the Turks will say, no, we're the Muslim country. Um, now in Turkey, uh, you know, women are actually able to excuse me, wear the headscarf in public places. Um, and so things are changing a little bit there. Uh, not so much, in my estimation, to be closer to the Iranian model, but to be closer to the U.S. American model, where there simply is more religious freedom in the public square. This is Ingrid Matson. She's a good friend and colleague of mine. Uh, she accepted Islam. She was raised Catholic, but never very seriously in terms of religious practice, as she recalls. Uh, she uh, accepted Islam over 30 years ago, and when she did, she put on the hijab, and you just have to take my word for it that Ingrid Matson is anything but the uh, stereotypically oppressed Muslim woman. Uh, she was president of the Islamic Society of North America for two terms, and uh, she was also chair of uh, the uh, chaplaincy program, Islamic chaplaincy program at Hartford Seminary, and now is chair of the Islamic Studies Department um, at a Canadian university whose name is currently escaping uh, me, so I apologize for that. This is Mohammed al Baradai, another a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Uh, he was leading the International Atomic Energy Association in its investigation of uh, the alleged cache of weapons of mass destruction that Saddam Hussein had in Iraq. He was the guy in Iraq who was saying to his bosses at the UN, please tell the Bush administration to hold off. I now have unfettered access to all of uh, Saddam Hussein's sites. At this point, Hussein was very worried that the Americans were serious about invading, but the Americans had already made up their mind. Um, but Baradai won uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. Recently, uh, Baradai uh, uh, has been part of the movement for democracy in Egypt. He was a strong opponent of uh, Mohamed Morsi, uh, the elected president of Egypt, and actually tried to participate in the new government after the military deposed Mohamed Morsi, uh, but ended up resigning from that government because of the brutal tactics that General Sisi began to adopt uh, in instituting this new regime that is now currently uh, running the show in Egypt. This is Rokaya Basara. Uh, she won the 400-meter dash in the Asian Games in 2004. I think she's sporting one of the great symbols of the encounter of tradition with modernity, a hijab with a Nike swoosh. There it is. 
Um, you notice she's wearing uh, under her her track uh, 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 kit. Uh, she's wearing full length Under Armour covering down to the wrist, and she's also wearing full length pants. Um, you know, uh, when interviewed, she said, you know, she's a Muslim woman and she wants to honor God and gave her all this skill to run, etc. Now, uh, Ruqayya doesn't actually run anymore. Anyone know why? You know, God answers the past, well, she got married, her husband doesn't want her to do that. You know, again, more of the stereotypes of the oppressed Muslim woman, even so she's an accomplished athlete. No, and I don't say this to embarrass Ruqayya, but just to kind of drive home the point I'm trying to make here, the point that Muslims are human beings like the rest of us. Bukhaya, Asara, doesn't run anymore because she was caught doping. <laughs> doping! She was caught doping! So there it is. I mean, we're wearing a hijab and we're trying to be faithful to God and then we're cheating. So, you know, it's like, uh, you know, one of the, one of the great features of, of religious life and the attempt, even the honest attempt, to, to live a life of faith is hypocrisy. We, we don't live up to the ideals that we profess and are supposed to live up to. Um, and this is Imam Faisal ibn Abd al-Rauf and his wife Daisy Khan. They are the, and I mean this with my tongue firmly in my cheek, the radical Muslim terrorists responsible for the mosque at Ground Zero. Their idea was, their idea was after September 11th, you know, Imam uh, Rauf would hear people say, where are the moderate Muslims? Now, despite the fact that that question falls on the ears of most Muslims, like the question, um, uh, where are the non pedophile priests? You get that? I mean, non -pedophile, moderate Muslim is a funny kind of expression because it implies that most Muslims are not like sane, you know, kind of, you know, compassionate, normal human being. That the moderates are the exception, so to speak, right? But like non-pedophile priest implies that most priests are pedophiles, but, but actually the opposite is true. Anyway, sorry for that little tangent, but they, they wanted, in the wake of September 11th, people were saying, you know, we're only hearing what the extremists have to say. What about the quote-unquote good Muslims? Said, yeah, well, we, we need to do something. So let's follow the example of our Jewish neighbors, who've got this wonderful institution uh, on the Upper East Side called the 92nd Street Y. Those of you that have lived in New York know, 92nd Street Y is this great kind of community institution. They have all kinds of educational programs. Yes, there's like, you know, gym facilities and stuff, but it really is a community center where all kinds of learning goes on. You know, there's all kinds of interfaith, you know, events that take place there. So Imam Rauf thought, and, and his wife, Nizi Khan, thought, let's have a Muslim version of this. We'll call it the Cordoba Initiative, and we'll build a center near, in Lower Manhattan, near Ground Zero, so we can try to take Islam back from the violent perpetrators of 9-11, who, who kind of hijacked our religion and took it from us, at least in the eyes of the, 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 so much of the world, especially the non-Muslim world. And um, they were going along, they had great support in the Jewish community, the zoning board in Lower Manhattan voted you know, unanimously to approve this project, and then the midterm elections were coming up in 2010, and all kinds of politicians who wanted to make hay uh, by professing to people that they would save them and protect them from all these dangerous Muslims that were lurking among us started to talk about on Fox News the mosque at Ground Zero. And this thing spun out of control. By the way, the mosque at Ground Zero opened last year, and you didn't even hear about it because the media had moved on. Like all human beings, Muslims have diverse and complex identities which shape them as social actors. It's the only point I'm trying to make here. Muslims are human beings too. Okay. Number five, <clears throat> why is there so much conflict in the Muslim world? Why, for example, are Sunnis and Shiites killing each other in Iraq or Syria? Is Islam, are Muslims inherently violent? The question that, this last question is disturbing as it may be for some of us, is quite understandable. If you see people embroiled in conflict, 
And all you know about those people, all you're told about those people, is that they're Muslims. Then you think their Islam must have a lot to do with why they're in conflict with each other. You don't get the full picture of who they are in their social context, or even what the historical background is that has set the stage for these conflicts that go on before us and that are covered by the media sound lines. This image in the upper left-hand corner of the slide is not an image of Shiites and Sunnis killing each other in Iraq or in Syria. It's an image of Protestants and Catholics. Yes, it's post-2009, post-Good Friday Accords, embroiled in violent conflict in Northern Ireland. Now, some of you might say, Scott, 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 Scott. Foul, foul. You can't make this analogy. Everybody that knows the situation in Northern Ireland knows that that conflict between Protestants and Catholics is not essentially a religious conflict. Yes, you're right, and that's exactly my point. That's why I'm using the analogy. What do I mean by that? Okay, well, here are uh, Bishop um, Richardson and Bishop Brady. Bishop Richardson is the Anglican primate of Ireland, and Bishop Brady, the Roman Catholic primate of Ireland. Now, if this were an essentially religious conflict between Protestants and Catholics, um, these guys would be at each other's throats, not posing for a photo op. The reason they're posing for a photo op is because they have used the offices of their respective episcopacies to try to transform the conflict in Northern Ireland, not inflame it. Um, so if it's not essentially a religious conflict, what is it? Well, anyone that knows the history of Ireland knows the roots of the current conflict go back to the 11th century and the dynamic of invasion, colonialism, and domination of a people by another. So you have the Irish in Ireland who are speaking Irish, or Gaelic if you prefer, and they're invaded by the English. Or different people speak a different language. Um, you know, ostensibly on one level, they're all Catholic with some form of allegiance to Rome. Uh, but this power struggle supersedes uh, whatever they may have in common religiously. When we move to the period of the Reformation, and the Church of England splits from the Church of Rome, now you've added another, especially for people that want to, that are deeply embroiled in this conflict and, 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 and are trying to work it out to its logical end, the domination of one or the other, the ousting of the, 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 the English from Ireland, or the English final subjugation of Ireland, whichever the scenario is that you prefer, you know, now religion has been added to it, so this is great. Now we can say it's God's will that we fight against these, these, these awful people who are on the other side of this political fence that divides us. So what does this tell us about a place like Iraq? Well, this image is meant to be the parallel image of the youth throwing the Molotov cocktails in Northern Ireland. This is the mosque in Samarra, the Shiite mosque, that was destroyed, I think, in 2006 by allegedly Sunni insur insurgents. So you have this allegedly Sunni-Shiite conflict going on. We don't know for a fact that Sunni insurgents did it, but perhaps they did it. Perhaps uh, sectarianism uh, was part of the motivation. But at the very same time, here is a group of Sunni and Shiite clerics. Sunni and Shiite clerics who are gathering in Baghdad to issue a joint fatwa against sectarian violence, against Shiite on Sunni or Sunni on Shiite violence. This is the parallel of Bishop Richardson and Brady. These are the religious leaders. You know, if, 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 if this conflict between Sunnis and Shiites in Iraq is essentially a religious conflict, you couldn't get these people in the same room. And not only are they in the same room and respecting each other's colleagues, but they're drafting a joint document condemning this very dynamic of uh, sectarian violence. I showed you a map of Ireland, I'm going to show you a map of Iraq. Because unless we understand the history, of the nation state we know as Iraq, we're not really ever going to understand 
the conflicts between Sunnis and Shiites. Anyone know, first of all, who drew the boundaries of the nation state of Iraq? Who created the nation state of Iraq? The British. Yeah, good. So we have some people that know the The British. The British and the French, by the way, created most of the modern Middle East. Most of the boundaries of the nation states of the modern Middle East were drawn by the British and the French in the aftermath of the First World War and the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. And you think when the British and the French were drawing those boundaries, let me just ask this question. They care more about British and French interests, or they care more about the integrity of the societies that were living in those regions? Not just, just, right. Yeah, the former, right, exactly. The former, exactly. I'm nothing against the British and the French. This is kind of human. We call this original sin in Catholicism. So they're drawing the boundaries. And now the problem with the way these boundaries are drawn, one of many, is that up in the north, you have a large uh, group of Sunni Kurds. So religiously, they're Sunni Muslims. Ethnically, they're Kurds. They're not Arabs, they speak Kurdish. Okay, in the south, you have the largest group. They're Shiite Arabs. So they practice Shiite Islam, not Sunni Islam. They're not Kurds, they're Arabs. They learn native languages Arabic. In the center, the smallest group, Sunni Arabs. So they share the Sunnism of the Kurds in the north, and they share the uh, Arab ethnic identity of the Shiites in the south. Now when the British set up the monarchy to run Iraq after they were sort of out no longer governing Iraq as a colonial power, which group do you think they set up the monarchy in? The smallest one. Why the smallest one? This is, this is a, a tactic for indirect rule. If you set up the, the, the local government in the post-colonial uh, situation in the smallest group, that government will continue to depend on the, the former colonial power for its stability and security. So what's set up here is, you know, the monarchy will be here. You'll benefit from your relationship with us. You'll provide us with a lot of the oil that we want from your region. You know, this is a this is a caricature, but it gets the point across. You know, and you will benefit from that. You'll get a lot of those spoils. Okay, that's fine for the Sunni Arabs. When the Baathist party overthrows the monarchy, it also comes from this privileged, increasingly privileged minority. And then Saddam Hussein continues to rule Iraq with an iron fist. The Kurds in the north, the Shiites in the south want more piece of the pie. They're all supposed to be Iraqis now. They woke up one morning and they had a flag, and they all had the same national identity, almost overnight. So can't we have some say in Iraqi self-determination? The answer, no, you can't. Because we have the power and we're not going to share it. Again, not something particularly Arab or Sunni, just something particularly human. The British drew the boundaries. The Americans invade in 2003, and they say, we're going to have a democracy in Iraq. <laughs> so what do you think the Sunni Arabs are saying, the smallest group? Oops. A democracy, we're the smallest group. The Shiites are saying, yay, <laughs> we're the largest group. If we have a democracy in Iraq, we're finally going to be able to govern ourselves. We're finally going to be able to have a say in what it means to be Iraqi, and we're finally going to be able to benefit from the resources of our country. Already by this time, the Kurds in the north are kind of living autonomously because there had been a no-fly zone. Well, when the Americans invade and they start to institute democracy and you know democratic processes start to unfold, and the Shiites come to the fore, you know what the Arab Sunni said? They said, we are so grateful for the Americans coming to invade our country. <laughs> Because we have been losing sleep for so long, knowing that as a minority, we had all this power ourselves. And now we're so glad that the Americans have come and shown us the light, and, and now have, 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 have encouraged us to share power and wealth with our Sunni Arab sisters, Shiite Arab sisters and brothers in the South. No, they didn't say it. Especially because for years under Saddam Hussein, the Baathist regime, the Shiites in the South were, were the victims of a lot of oppression. So the idea is, if they now get power, they'll oppress us. 
This, my friends, is far more uh, uh, relevant to understand the conflict between Sunnis and Shiites than any exploration of the difference between Sunni and Shiite doctrine or practice of Islam. The same as you have in Northern Ireland. That's why I use that example. I'm going to move on to my sixth point. It has to do with the J word. Um, and what I'm trying to con contrast here using these two images, the images are, 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 are of uh, Salahuddin al Ayyubi, uh, the great uh, 12th century um, organizer of Muslim forces to resist the Crusades and push back the Crusaders back to Europe and retake the Muslim lands that were once Christian lands that the Crusaders came back to retake. Okay, it's a complicated story, obviously. To the right, again, we see our friend Osama bin Laden. What I'm contrasting here in this slide is classical jihad theory and practice on the one hand, and so-called modern jihadism on the, two, on, the, on the other. They're two very different phenomena. And there are a lot of people that want to make a facile connection between there is a connection, and I'll have something to say about that, but, but we have to really understand the nature of that connection. What is classical jihad theory and practice? Well, in a nutshell, it's Muslim just war theory. I'll say it again. In a nutshell, classical jihad theory and practice is Muslim just war theory. As you know, historically, neither Christianity nor Islam are pacifist religious traditions. They're not giant. Okay, uh, there are a few major religious traditions, by the way, that are pacifists. Interesting to explore why that might be, but we don't have time to do that. Um, so, like Christianity, Islam developed um, uh, a kind of uh, philosophy and ethics of thinking about when corporate violent action was licit and when it was not. And actually, it tracks in some ways similar to, in some ways similar to just war theory, in terms of um, use uh, in bello and use ad bellum criteria. You know, in other words, the just reasons uh, for going to war, use ad bellum, and the, and the just execution of them. So, you know, what are the, what are the criteria that, that have to be met as justification for actually waging war on other people? And then how does one morally conduct warfare? Okay, so you have the same kinds of concerns in classical jihad theory about non-combatants, about preserving the environment, uh, and about just reasons for going to war. In fact, what's really interesting is uh, that the word jihad in the Quran, in its broadest sense, means the struggle to live righteously. And the reason why the word jihad, I would argue, is applied to justify corporate violence is because the only kind of justified corporate violence in Islam is corporate violence that is an integral part of the struggle to live righteously. You can only understand what jihad means in this technical sense of just war theory if you understand the broader valence of that term in the Quran. The broader valence is it's the struggle to live righteously. Getting up every morning and saying your dawn prayer is jihad for Muslims. Treating your neighbor with respect and compassion, you know, and maybe denying yourself some, some benefit or pleasure in the process is jihad. It's all part of the struggle to live according to God's word, God's law. And therefore, any form of violence, violence is itself abhorrent from a Muslim perspective. The only kind of violence that would be acceptable would be violence that is a sine qua non of the struggle to live righteously. So for instance, um, uh, spreading justice in the world when there is injustice or defending the Muslim community um, and its attempt to live the law of God from those who would try to radically transform their community and take away their dedication to the law of God, etc. What is jihadism? Well, it's kind of, a, it's a very modern phenomenon. As some of you know, Osama bin Laden got his start as an employee of the CIA in Afghanistan, uh, fighting a proxy war against the Soviets. 
And um, one of the ways in which this proxy war was conducted was to raise up a whole generation of young men to fight against the Soviet occupation in Afghanistan uh, in the 80s. And where did they go? And this was in part with CIA consultation. They went to the madrasas. Now, madrasa has such a bad name because of media soundbites. Madrasa is simply a school of religious learning in, in, in a Muslim context. Like at CTU, when I go to the Arab world, I talk about CTU as a madrasa. I teach in a madrasa. It's a seminary. It's where people come to learn to be Christian leaders. That's what a madrasa is. Well, you know, because of colonialism and the breakdown of traditional educational systems, many of the madrasas in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, began to just be very poorly funded and be places where poor families could send their, their sons to go to learn how to read Quran, to get some basic literacy, learn a little Arabic and get some basic literacy. But the idea was, I know, let's, let's take madrasa education, and where some of these young men are coming, and raise up a whole generation of mujahideen to fight the Soviets. And so textbooks were produced in Nebraska with your tax dollars that taught mathematics in the following way. Six infidel tanks, in this case infidel and Soviets, that's why U.S. tax dollars are paying. We didn't know that it could be switched very easily from mean Americans. Six infidel tanks are bearing down your village. Uh, through the, the power and grace of God, you fire three rocket propelled grenades and are able to destroy three infidel tanks. How many infidel tanks are left for you to vanquish by the power of Almighty God? Again, it's funny but it's sad because we're teaching a, a whole generation of young boys math in this way. We're not just teaching them math. What we're doing is participating in stripping down their Muslim identity, an identity which, which, which ought to be rich and full and include the deep spirituality of what it means to be Muslim. We're stripping down their Muslim identity into a political ideology. What it means to be Muslim is fighting and killing infants. This, my friends, is the genesis of modern jihadism. And ironically, you know, historically, it's part of the records, the United States has a lot to do towards the end of the Cold War in the production of this new phenomenon. And then for a lot of complicated reasons that we can't go into, um, this jihadism it takes on a life of its own, uh, turns, and once the Soviets are out of it, Afghanistan eventually sets its sights on the United States itself. But classical jihad theory and the Quranic notion of jihad and the jihadism associated with Osama bin Laden are really two very different historical phenomena. The only connection is that jihadism uses the language of classical uh, jihad theory so that it can be accepted as normative and traditional uh, in the Muslim community when it's really right. I want to talk a little bit about Islam and politics. Um, and I wanted to sort of strike a cautionary note. Beware the spin doctors in the media, or they get covered in the media. Obsessed with dying utopian fantasies. I'm referring to two dying utopian fantasies. One represented by Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and one represented by um, Senator Mark Kirk of Illinois. He's one of my senators. Um, why do I pick these two? Um, well, let me just read what's here, because it has to do with the uh, the Democracy movement in Tahrir Square in January of, uh, of 2011. Um, Ayatollah Khamenei, when he was commenting on this as it was unfolding, the democracy movement in Egypt, was clinging to a dream that the fulfillment of the hopes of Tahrir Square can lie only in an anti-secular Islamist regime. He gave a three-hour khutbah, a three-hour sermon uh, in Tehran about how this was really an Islamist revolution taking place in Egypt. 
and that even was on the verge of an Islamic revolution like Iran, and you know, it was going to become a, a, an Islamic state which would finally free itself from all relations with the West, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thoroughly anti-secular, thoroughly anti-Western. Senator Mark Kirk posted a letter to President Obama, an open letter to President Obama on his website, saying that whatever President Obama does, he cannot allow the Muslim brothers to become part of any political uh, reconstruction of Egypt after the fall of Mubarak. Now, this is highly problematic since the Muslim Brothers were the, the most organized force of resistance to Mubarak's totalitarian regime, and one of the strongest advocates for democracy, not exactly Jeffersonian democracy, but at least more, participa more participation in government by the people throughout that period. Now all of a sudden Mark Kirk is saying, you know, marginalize these people. Well, Mark Kirk's dream came true, actually. The uh, duly elected Muslim Brotherhood president of Egypt, Mohamed Morsi, was ousted by a military coup. He's still somewhere. We don't know exactly where he is. Most of the leaders of the Brotherhood have been jailed. Their finances have been confiscated. Many people protesting the name of the Brotherhood have been killed. So it looks like Senator Kirk's utopian fantasy has come true. What's his utopian fantasy? It's the opposite of Khomeini. The only solution uh, to uh, the ills of Egyptian society is that the Egyptian people will finally and thoroughly embrace a Western secular form of government in which Islam becomes a private affair, a private matter, but in which there's a nice, healthy separation of church and state. I call both of these positions utopian fantasies because they're completely unrealistic, at least from my perspective as a historian. And um, dying, well, you know, if, if Kirk's, Mark Kirk's is dying, it certainly has got an extra few breaths, most recently in Egypt. But I would stand by this notion that, that these are dying fantasies. <coughs> because what's happening in most of Muslim countries is, is sort of what, what's already happened in Turkey. People are looking for a way to integrate the best of secular modernity with the best of tradition. Because only in this way can they be wholly and fully who they are. And so, unless we recognize that any political solution in some of these countries is going to be an integration of certain secular modern ideals and values with traditional Muslim ideals and values, I think we're going to be in for a very, very rough ride um, internationally, rougher than the one that we're already experiencing. Uh, just some of the proof here. Here, here are uh, people in Tahrir Square praying Salat. So you've got great devotion of faith of some of the young people that were part of this movement. Um, there were also Coptic Christians who held masses in, in Tahrir Square. But the slogan of many of the people in Tahrir Square was the same as that of the Tunisian Arab Spring. A sha'ab yurid askat al the people want the fall of the regime. They were Egyptians loyal to Egypt. They wrapped themselves in the Egyptian flag. They didn't want the downfall of their country. They just wanted Mubarak to go. And they wanted a constitution that enshrined more democratic ideals. So there was a real um, you know, kind of conversation between secular ideals of what democracy is and how it can function and deeply held religious values. This pamphlet was widely circulated in Tahrir Square. This Montgomery, the story of Montgomery, and uh, nonviolent resistance against oppression. The crowds in Tahrir Square and, and other places in Cairo and other places in Egypt when they were protesting, you'd hear them chanting, Selmiya, Selmiya, peaceful, peaceful. Don't pick up a stone and throw it. Don't give the military an excuse to be violent. The military ought to work on behalf of the people. And then finally, one of my favorite images that's actually loathed by extremists, both Christians and Muslims, the same kind of people that called John Paul II the Antichrist because he was kissing the Quran. People standing in Tahrir Square with the Muslim tasbih, the Muslim rosary over the Bible in Arabic, 
or the cross, you know, put next to the Quran, showing Christian Muslim solidarity. 10% yeah, of the Egyptian population are Christians, 90% Muslim, but Christian Muslim Egyptian solidarity in these hopes and yearnings for a new future for Egypt. Yeah, last point has to do with sort of coming full circle to Islamophobia, where we began. This is the image of Terry Jones. Remember Pastor Terry Jones? He was a big part of the Summer of Hate back in 2010. He was going to burn the Quran. He eventually didn't do it then. He eventually actually did it. Well, there was much less uh, media coverage for it. Um, does anyone know who this gent is? Anders Berry Breivik. Uh, he, if you read his thousand page manifesto, um, he's, you know, thoroughly convinced that uh, Islam is invading Europe and de-Christianizing Europe and he gunned down 70 uh, young people in a youth camp on an island off the coast of Oslo in his native Norway. Originally, it's very interesting, originally um, uh, in the defense was and the court accepted, the Norwegian court accepted that he was mentally ill. I think it's funny that when, you know, <laughs> White Christians do something like this, they're mentally ill. And when, when Muslims do this, they're just, just part of, you know, it's just their, their awful religion that's motivating them to do this. But other people in Norway can't say it's this crazy Christianity that's making them do this. So they, they say, well, he's mentally ill. That defense ultimately was not accepted, and I don't know exactly what his, what his sentence was. Um, but we have a real, real problem with Islamophobia, as what I would argue is a virulent new form of racism in the West. We have Islamophobic books and movies, which are cottage industry, the Islam, what the West needs to know, um, uh, produced by Robert Spencer, um, the truth about Muhammad, founder of the world's most intolerant religion. I thought the jury was still out on the world's most intolerant religion, but Robert Spencer doesn't think so. Um, Robert Spencer is affiliated with Pamela Geller. Here's a picture of them together. Uh, Geller runs the Stop the Islamization of America website, uh, which has now won the dubious distinction of making the list of hate websites of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And indeed, that's what it is. But she's behind so much of this, uh, this effort to ban Sharia law. Now, folks, <laughs> I don't have time to get into all the intricacies of what Sharia actually means, etc., etc. But I'll tell you what it comes down to for most Muslims. When you say ban Sharia law for most Muslims, it looks something like this. I'm making out my last will and testament. And I want to make sure that when I make out my last will and testament, um, I apportion my wealth according to the Quranic precepts. So I give my children their share, my sisters and brothers their share, and my parents their share, if they're still alive. And of course, I can write this into my will as an American citizen, and that's fine, because nothing about doing that conflicts with the supremacy of American law. Jews do this all the time when they follow halakha. Christians do it all the time when they're following their own values and ideals and their tradition. If you ban Sharia law, from being able to be considered in an American court of law, then the will of a Muslim simply trying to freely practice her faith by apportioning her goods in her last will to her heirs according to how she believes God wants her to do so could be challenged as completely inadmissible. So uh, this is one of the reasons why many of these initiatives have been blocked by the courts because they run squarely up against First Amendment freedoms of uh, the practice of religion, and there's no need for them since the principle of the supremacy of the U.S. law is well established. I want to leave you with a little humor. It might seem a little harsh to some of you, but you know it's late and I think it's a good note to end on. And also, in an act of humility, let you know that I sincerely am aware of the fact that a comedian can sometimes do in three minutes what the so-called scholar like me would have to take at least 25 minutes to do. So I'm going to leave you in the able hands on this question of Sharia law in the United States of none other than Stephen Colbert. Um, watching a segment uh, that he likes to call Radical Muslim Snacks. Uh, maybe some of you have seen it. 
Uh, maybe you have not. Uh, why did he disappear? Let me see. Ladies and gentlemen, sex. Now that I've got your attention, now that I've got your attention, death. This is the threat down. Recently, Oklahoma passed a ballot initiative forbidding the use of Islamic Sharia law. Thank God. It is the only thing keeping Oklahoma's huge Muslim population from instituting burqa night at the Tulsa Hooters. <laughs> Unfortunately, in other states, Sharia law is still coming at us in a very creepy way. We are seeing Sharia creep along in all kinds of Western countries. Fears that Sharia law is creeping into the United States. There is something called creeping Sharia. Are you familiar with the phrase Sharia creep? Could Sharia law be creeping into everyday American life, hidden inside a sandwich? <laughs> That's right. A sandwich of death. And for once, I'm not talking about Arby's. And that's why threat number three is radical Muslim snacks. As usual, Pat Robertson was all over this meat menace. Hello, food. It sounds innocent. I mean, hey, what's wrong with kosher? That's fine. I don't I like kosher. Oh, there is no greater friend of kosher than Pat Robertson. I'd go so far as to call him a Hebrew nationalist. But Pat knows the danger of halal. Halal is prepared according to the rules of Sharia law. An important, an important distinction, folks. To slaughter an animal under kosher rules, you cut across the neck of a conscious animal with a non-serrated blade in one clean attempt, avoiding the spinal cord. But under halal, you cut across the neck of a conscious animal with a non-serrated blade in one clean attempt, avoiding the spinal cord while saying the name of Allah. <laughs> Radicalizes the brisket. <laughs> no problem, you say. I just, I just won't eat it, right? That's what the people in Britain thought. A London Daily Mail investigation found that Britain's major supermarket chains, fast food restaurants, even some hospitals and schools were serving halal food without telling those who were eating it. They're eating secret Muslim food. <laughs> And that's even worse than whatever it is the British consider food now. <laughs> and folks, halal has got America in its creep sites. In the United States, McDonald's, Walmart, and Whole Foods now offer halal choices. Not choices! <laughs> folks, we are dangerously close to being served filet al fish. Okay, folks, that's my presentation, and if you, uh, those of you that like to stay, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.